Hello and welcome to Moving Forward, the show where we examine the TNT music industry, looking at the past and present to forge a better future. I'm Robin Foster and I host this show with Mario Russell or DJ Mario of Downtown Outlaws. Today we talk to Colin Lucas. He is a musician, arranger, producer, band leader, and corporate manager. Colin, welcome to Moving Forward. Hi, hi, good evening. Good All evening. right. Good evening and as usual in this show, Mario, you open the innings. You open the bowling. Go through. Yeah, okay, Colin. Um, I'd like to get a little bit about your history, like how early you started in the game. I mean, I remember you as early as when you used to move around with your, your dad. You know, but you could give us a little history so people could know how long you're out here. And um, Song Rev to me was like the first band as a little fella I remember in the Cavallo days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. You hear me throw that in, right, Robin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I hear. I will give, I will give my first memories of um, Song Rev too, but you <laughs> fix up Mario first. <laughs> yeah. All right, but it might surprise you to know that Song Rev mm-hmm. had a precursor band, you know called Iraq, A-R-A-C, Andre, Richard, Arturo Charles, Andre Day, Richard Ramsubag, Arturo Macano, and Charles Assam. They had this band called Iraq and um, was in the area where I lived. And um, they invited me, you know, because uh, Andre and Charles were friends of mine. So I ended up, you know, gigging with them and so on. And then they decided, hey, what about if we make a bigger band? And um, Sound Revolution was born out of that thought. And not only out of the thought, but with the assistance of a gentleman called Don Bihari, who was a businessman in the area. And um, he assisted, and I mean assisted, eh? really put his (laughs) money where his mouth was. And, um, you know, Sound Revolution was born in 1976. Yeah, 1976. 1976. Right. Which means I was about five years old, huh? <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Now, um, what I f- my first memories of Song Revolution was when I had a graduation from QRC in 1977. Song Revolution played in the QRC hall in my graduation. That was the first time... I'd ever hear about Song Revolution and the band come and they get on. And then I was told that um, in that time, there was, was the Song Revolution started in UE by chance? No, no, it wasn't. Um, I happened to have attended UE in Mona. Right. right? Um, and then when I'd come back permanently, that's when they decided, well, let's step up from a combo, which was about, you know, four or five man band, and they wanted to make it a little bigger. Um, Tony Woodruff, one of the earlier members, he was in St. Augustine at the time. So maybe that is where that connection was established. Right, because there was this whole thing about there were two bands that started in UE um, Song Revolution in the Trinidad UE and third world in the in Mona and all that kind of thing. <laughs> ah, all right. I actually knew the third world guys in um in Mona and when I told them this is no joke, huh? I went to a concert with them. That's before they were big and this concert was in Taylor Hall. Mm-hmm. And I listened to this band and I went to Katko after their performance and told them I said, guys trust me, you're gonna be an international music force. Take my word for it. Incidentally, I also made that prediction for Freddie McGregor. I was in a band with Freddie McGregor in Jamaica called Generation Gap. Freddie was the lead singer and drummer. And I told him early o'clock, I said, Freddie, you will be an international star. Bam. I was right on both counts. All right. Good boy. Mario? (laughs) Well, he's setting up himself for some serious questions here because the first question will come to mind is if these fellas become stars and you were so popular in Trinidad, why you didn't become an international star too, like these fellas? Well, I think the the simple, there are two simple answers. One, I'm not in their class of talent. And two, music was and has always been, has remained my hobby, whereas it was, you know, their Mm -hmm. profession. You know, music was my hobby. 
Wow, okay. Well, um, yeah, that was a question I had for you too. I wanted to know that, um, <laughs> you know, someone like you, you're, I consider you, I consider you like um, a great songwriter. I mean, I mean, people in Trinidad, we tend to look at, at things that not talking about politics or talking about some kind of social thing, right? As as not serious. In other words, um, I find Dollar Wine is a brilliant song, right? The, the story and thing of, of the song. You know, it could be a part, a part, right? No, no, no. And many of the songs you did, like um, that Rewind Fast Forward, the Jack and thing, I love them songs, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, they, they, they know they, they, they're genuinely funny, and and it you could tell it had like thought and something that went into the writing, you know. But I um I always felt that you should write a song that makes sense, even if it's a party song. That's correct. Because there's nothing to say that because something makes sense, you can't dance it. I mean, if you go back in time and think up think about songs like bills, bills every day. Bills, bills, my cappy. Mm -hmm. Talking about the cost of living, but everybody whining down in the party. Black is white. Right. So make a song make sense. Let there be some theme that your subconscious mind can hold on to. So that even when the 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 the, the appeal, the, the the pure appeal of rhythm disappears, there is something, there's a thread of something that keeps your mind engaged to the song, you know? Um, there are a few silly songs that that really um, last very long. You know, they come out, they might have instant appeal and everybody likes them and thing, but you know, a few months down the road, gone, because there's nothing else. There's not what I call residual value, you know, that, that you can always go back to. So I always try to write songs that make sense. Okay, well, and another thing too is um, being a sound engineer and being around in those days, um, Song Revolution was one of the bands that always had a nice big sound and 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 I realized how you, you would come outside and your brother was the sound engineer, God rest his soul, right? Yeah. Right, and uh, yeah, and, and you would and you would come out and you would and make sure everything sounding good and everybody used to say, boy, you hear song rev, boy? You know, <laughs> mm. you know, I remember them days well, you know, so all that um meticulation, that's a word. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> right. All of that, um, I was thinking that that maybe you all would have um, like really pushed to go fan international and thing. Why that, you don't think that happened? Well, like I said, it was always my hobby. Now, there were guys in Sound Evolution that uh, made it their, their, their way of life, their livelihood. Eh? And in fact, down at the end, no, it wasn't the end. It was, you may remember that in 1990, there was a separation um, in Sound Revolution. And it, essentially, that was the, the the cause of the separation. There were guys who felt, listen, we, we need to do this um, full time. And there were other guys that were alternatively employed who did not want to leave their employment and so on. So the full time guys um, did just that. And actually, they spent a year or two campaigning out of Canada because it, it was... It, made more economic sense to be based outside there. Because if you're going to get a lot more international gigs, it's cheaper and easier for a promoter to fly you out of, out of North America um, to, to anywhere else, in, incidentally, and, and other places in North America, because a lot of, of the, the gig opportunities resided in North America. Just one quick question. Did they go under the name of Song Rev at that time? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Did they go under the name of Song, Re Song Revolution? Yes, they did. Um, although I had the name registered, mm -hmm. um, I had no problem in letting them keep the name and use it. So they went under the name of Song Revolution for many, many years. And do you know, even after the band uh, eventually um, broke up, Mose, the drummer, mm -hmm. um, Anthony Lewis, otherwise known as Mose, yeah, yeah. he formed a band called Mose Revolution. You know, All right. um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I and I I think, but not think I know part of that was 
to maintain the vibe of what sound evolution meant. The, the whole thing of one body and together we, we can really do this. And so he, he meant he kept, he made a band called Moj Revolution, mm -hmm. which I think exists even to today. Okay. Well, well, my picture of Song Revolution is always Colin Lucas, eh? so <laughs> I, I can't imagine how our next band would, or, or guys would come out and, and use the same Song Revolution name when you were such a prominent figure in the band, you know, and um, everybody knew you as, as probably the lead singer or the, or the owner of the band. And if you weren't there, it means you can put a question mark on the band. Where, where Colin? <laughs> you know? How did how well, were, how were the guys? Were they really successful in Canada or not? Yeah, they did well. And this is the thing. Mm -hmm. I know for some promoters um, mm -hmm. in the earlys, they kind of had some issues with that. Um, but I think the band acquitted itself well. Also, um, by 1992, you know, although I was by then a solo performer, Soundrev and I did a lot of gigs together. You know, so it mm -hmm. was it was really like. Hey, the good old times again. Um, but apart from me, they acquitted themselves well. You know, the, the musicians, um, they maintained a high standard of musicianship and execution so that um, even people who might have initially felt, uh, well, Colin not there so, by the time they heard the band a few times, okay, it was a little different without me. Anybody that's a part of a... Of a of a group that is no longer in the group, there will be a difference. But the difference was not a, did not mean a reduction in quality of the band. Well, um, in you had Dollar Wine in 1991, right? Around the same time. So when there was a split, had Dollar Wine had anything to do with that? Because Dollar Wine was a smash hit. And I mean, everybody was Dollar Wine in all over the place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um... I don't think anything could um, match that, that, that any of the guys did, could match Dollar Wine. So again, you are the prominent figure in Song Revolution, no matter what, <clears throat> you know, because you, even when you left the band, you, you created a monster hit, you know, as for what they did. did um, I, think, um, I think God sent that to, to keep me buoyant, <laughs> because um, although things worked out in the end and and and... You know, the issues were resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, the breakup was, you know, painful, to be quite honest. It was painful for all parties, I imagine. Yeah. Um, and I, I was I was really very sad uh, during that transition. You know, and strangely enough, I'll give you a quick story. There was a promoter called Huloy out of New York. Mm -hmm. And one day after the, the breakup, and the breakup was actually receiving a lot of if, you know, if social media existed in that day, no wow, I don't know what would have happened. So even without social media, um, the breakup of Sound Revolution was getting a lot of of airtime, put it that way. And one day I was in my little music room, uh, where Soundrev's band room used to be, and there was a knock on the door. And when I opened the door, there was this guy called Hugh Loy, the promoter. So, I mean, I had no name yet. He had um, promoted Soundrev uh, several years. So I greeted him warmly, and he came and he asked, he sat and he said, how are you doing, and so on, and da, 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 da. And I said, well, you know, he said, I know it must be a rough time. He said, I brought something for you. I said, well, you brought something for me? He opened a bag, a plastic bag, and in that plastic bag was a black shoulder bag, like a traveling shoulder bag. And the name, the brand name of that shoulder bag was Lucas. I, I smiled and he said to me, I brought this for you to remind you that you are who you are with or without some revolution. So do not lose heart. Continue to produce music and make people happy. I kept that bag and traveled, this is no joke, everywhere with that bag until it was in almost in tatters. And Hugh Loy met me again. This is now seven years later. And I was proud to show him the bag. I said, look, I don't go anywhere without this bag. Do you know Hugh Loy turned up at my house a couple of weeks later 
with a replacement Lucas bag. <laughs> <laughs> you like wherever you are, brother. Thank you. That meant so much to me psychologically and emotionally. You would not be me. Okay. Now, all right. So before we move on from Dollar Wine, um, Dollar Wine has become sort of a, a international kind of novelty hit, right? Um, you wrote that, um, the idea for that, did that come from the Tommy Joseph joke? Well, did you listen, the joke predated even Tommy Joseph, you know. Yeah. That joke is so old in Trinidad that it when it was originally told, it was farthing, tuppence, shilling, pound. Wow, I didn't know that. That's when Trinidad had British currency still. Would you believe that? <laughs> no, I, I, I never knew that. Let me hear that. <laughs> yeah. It was farthing, tuppence, shilling, pound. And of course, you know the original storyline is about this guy teaching his um, <clears throat> new and inexperienced bride, uh, coaching her in certain um, right. functional, functional prerequisites. Yes, yes. Fun married, matrimonial functional prerequisites, right? Yes, I understand. Yes, so, <laughs> in, so of course, which means the joke was horizontal. Um, I didn't think it would be appropriate for me to, to keep that uh, disposition <laughs> for the song. So I verticalized. <laughs> I verticalized it. So I was merely teaching the young lady how to whine in a party as against any other perhaps more private um, environment. Oh, uh -huh. all right. I so, hear. so um, um, this song, Football Dance, that inspired Dollar, dollar Wine because, like, um, that was before, right? It looks like fire, looks like peas, I remember. And, um, it was a dance, so a football dance. dance. Everybody was dance. dancing it. Right. So then it, that would have probably inspired you to go on another higher level and do dollar wine. <laughs> <laughs> I never tie the two songs together, you know. I, ain't gonna <laughs> <lie>. <laughs> I don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> you remember me well, good boy. <laughs> He's a DJ, you know. Yeah, that, that is true. That's true. That's true. Well, Shake It, Shake It, Remember Shake It was also a very big song yeah. that we used to play a lot. Um, 1987. Yeah, yeah, boy. You know, I have a joke about that song. David Rudder told me that they went to the Gladstonebury Festival or Charlie's Roots or something, singing um, for the English people and they do that song. Put your hand in the air and shake it. And they say the British people took it literal. They put their hand in the air and they did like this. They put, they put their hand in the air and shake it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember when um, Caldera was the, the voice on um, on that. Right, on yeah, track, yeah, yeah. Right? And when we did it as uh, Song Revolution in public and so on, we used to, at some point in, in, in the song, I would come out front with Caldero and we would go through those instructions, right? And he said, put your hand in the air, right? Then we say, okay, put your hand in the air and shake it. And everybody would do this. And we say, no, we never say shake your oh. hand. We say shake oh. it. And then we turn around and shake it for them. Oh, God. Well, if, if, if Chinese do that, I can't, I, can't, I can't vex with the British. If you say Chinese do that, I can't vex with the British at all. Imagine that. I take it back. <laughs> take it back. So wait, what other big hits you had at that time? Um, stay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so tell me something. Um... Did you ever expect those songs to like cross over to, the, to a bigger market or anything? W was that was that ever your focus? Um, in the case of Stay, that was I I I, I had you know that this could be an international song. Um, I expected Shake It to be a little more culture locked because of of the structure and you know what it was instructional, um, Trinidad soccer party kind of thing. But stay, when I did stay, um, it, I, did, I did it with the understanding of the potential. And you know, um, I don't know if you remember, but Eric Gale, who's a, 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 guitar a player. US mm -hmm. jazz guitar player, mm -hmm. he actually did stay as the title track on his 1989 album, I think. Okay, Except cool. on his album, it's called Let's Stay Together. All right, okay. I never knew that. I had to go back and check that now. I, I, can, what's, I can WhatsApp you track to you. Not a problem, not a problem. Thank you. Eh? WhatsApp. Right. 
there's a new version I have of Stay. Um, now, funny, I did an album about 10 years ago, guys, it's a, an album project. Mm -hmm. And then just so I decided not to release it. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah, would you believe? An entire album. I'm talking about artwork, everything complete, CD, everything completed. You know? So why you decide not, just, to, not you know, to release it? I, I just got a little despondent and a little disheartened and demotivated with several aspects of the of the industry. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, something called do even bother. And I just I just did nothing. Now the, the project started as a best of Colin Lucas, right? So okay. the whole idea was just to take the best of my songs and put them on one album. But as I pulled the songs and started listening to them, almost without fail, I started hearing how to play them and deliver them differently. So I would go in the studio and totally record, re-record the song. Um, and this went on for a while. And it's about 14 tracks. And in the process, while doing that, I started to write a couple new songs. So the, 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 the project has a few redone songs, um, like Stay, um, like a song called What's In It For Me, which is a reggae. Um, a song called It Just Ain't Right, which is a, 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 another reggae. Play the um, music. But it also has some new material. And it also has some, a few songs in their original way. Because when I tried to redo them, I couldn't come up with anything that improved what, in my mind, what was there. And, and also in the co-producers' minds. So that like Pan's mind is exactly how it was in, in its original form. Um, do the Iowa Butterfly Shadow Wave. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, in its yeah. original form. Big, big, big song, boy. <laughs> um, you know, I was in the hmm. Midem in 1997. And there was a European guy that came up and asked me, say you're from Trinidad, and he says, um, do you, the song sent five cent, ten cent dollar and thing. Do you know the person who did that song? And I said, yeah, Colin. I said, he's a friend of mine. So they said, can you put him in touch with me? I think I called you. And he wanted to publish the song or something. Because he said he was the guy who did, um, he, novelty songs was his thing. He said, um, there was, he took the song Alice, 24 years I've been living next door to Alice. And he put Alice, who the fuck is Alice, you know? He's the kind of guy, you, you remember that, that version? He's the guy that, that did, yeah. And he wanted, he wanted Dollar Wine, you know? I think I, I think I put him, I think we gave him your number or something. And he ended and I up. I did sign a publishing agreement. All right. Did he ever put it out or anything? No. Um, a strange thing happened. So, and there's some speculation. So I wouldn't say the speculations. I'll just say what happened and and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. So we started this agreement and so on. And we did. He flew me up to Germany, and we did a a, um, a different version of dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. Very soon after I came back, he called me and he said, Colin, um, I thought you said that nobody else had the publishing. Oh, God. And I said, no, nobody has the publishing. I never signed a publishing agreement with anybody else. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't do that. Why? He said, well, when he went to register the publishing in Germany, he found that there was already a <laughs> publishing mm -hmm. application under the name Sony. I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, it's it's there under Sony. Sony has applied for the publishing, to, to register the publishing of, of the song. And I said, unequivocally, no, I have signed no agreement with, with Sony. So he said, um, okay, um, leave it up to me. This clearly has to go legal. And a couple of months later, I, I asked him, I said, so was it, was the, um, What's the situation with that? Now he said, oh, they withdrew the, um, the application. I said, and? He said, nothing, they withdrew the application. Okay. I say no more. <laughs> oh, who? Oh. <laughs> Did he withdraw his ap application as well? <laughs> no, he, he kept the, 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 that publishing contract, went for 10 years. Nothing ever, ever came up. Came up. Okay. 
All right, all right. So because he never released it. Other things may have come of it, but no. All right, no. What I found is that anytime something is like about to happen with any Trinidad song, somehow people all come out of the, the woodwork and say that I have this or this is thing thing and the people who want it tend to back off. Right? You ever notice that happening? Yep. Yeah. It's 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 quite amazing. I mean I could tell you some stories about me and Dollar Wine and, and some international things. In fact, right now I'm fighting some international things. Um, it's amazing. There's no shortage of thieves mm -hmm. and con men out there. No shortage. All right. Well, let me ask a question. Is that because we do things too much on a handshake? Um, I think... In the early days, I would have said so. Um, but I think now it is because a lot of the innards of the music industry, there are a lot of informal relationships that exist right. between different music giants out there. And they can cause certain things to happen and cause certain things not, not to, happen. Mm -hmm. to happen once it suits their purpose. You know, um, at one point in time, Dollar Wine was at the brink of a BBC One uh, must-play list. Mm -hmm. I forgot what they are, like power rotation, what we call power rotation. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, it was on the brink of that. Um, and in fact, I, I got a call just before the announcement was to be made, a congratulatory call from mm -hmm. London, um, because the person was involved in, in the so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Um, but the next day when the announcement was made, a different song was called. Hmm. Uh, and that was like a shocker to everybody that was in, involved in the process. And the person called me back and apologized profusely. And I said, no, listen, you don't have to apologize. You didn't do anything wrong. But he felt badly that he had, he, you know, he had given me the heads up and things did not turn out. And he made it his business to try to find out what, what was the thing. And, and it took him a few years. I kid you not. Because it, it actually bugged him more than it bugged me. Right? Um, mm -hmm. You know the guy, actually. Mice, Martin. We, Martin, we, yeah, oh, yeah. We, 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 we He was on. He was. We already interviewed him for the same right. show. Well, he chased that story down for years until he found the truth, and and he shared it with me. I, I can't share it. <laughs> right, yeah. And that song so much like another story I heard from England. Um, you know about you know, who was supposed to get a song and it was supposed to go to this company and then this other one moved before and, you know, always this kind of bacchanal, you know. Um, so, all right. So you never saw it fit to leave um, the corporate world to go into music full time. You never no. saw that. No, and I'll tell you why. Eh? I, I always had this fear that... The day that I felt I, ha I was compelled to create music to make a living, that my, my motivation would move from passion to economics. Oh, okay. And I, I really did. I, I was fearful of that happening because what happens sometimes with that is that if you're motivated by making the money, if you can drop or reduce your creativity or your pursuit of excellence and still make money, as much money, or as we have seen very often in the real world, even more money. In other words, you, you start to write less and less compelling songs, songs of less and less quality, but you make money because your image and your brand and everything carrying you and so on. I was really afraid 
that I might start doing that, and, and that bothered me tremendously. So I said, Colin, leave it as your passion, leave it as your hobby, and, um, you know, go with that. Do it for enjoyment. I mean, if you make money, great, and, and so on, but, you know. All right, it but... It's been a tactical error, eh? I, you know, but that's, that's, that's how I thought it through. All right, but the spillover, the the being um, that sort of corporate manager, did that help with the music at all? I think in many in many regards, and um, people might find this a strange comment, but if you if you listen to my songs, um, I think most of my songs are written more from logic than from talent, you know? Um, there, there's a story thread that that is followed and, and, and you know, the, 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 the story is, is packaged in a way that, you know, like chapters in, 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 a, in a book or, or financial statements that are presented in a particular way to, to show a story, you know, to, to lead you to certain conclusions and, and stuff. They're, Guys, not just uh, uh, good songwriting. Well, you know, some people, I, I think the better ones among us are, are, are inspired. And even though some stuff is happening in the back, they get this inspiration and they could put out a song, or put out songs. And those songs might fulfill everything I'm talking about. But for me, I had to, to, to specifically say, okay, this is what you are doing and you must not step away from doing this. I had to compel myself. I had to think it through and slug it through. Um, so that's why, I, you know, I, I think it, it comes more from an effort to be logical and rational rather than what people call talent. Okay, all right. But, um, okay, and there's a school of thought that... Um Although we had a lot of talented people and we do all these things that there was never a, like a, a serious corporate figure, like a, a, a Chris Blackwell or, um, you know, a, a, a hardcore business person in the thing, right? Um, do you think we, we suffered from that? Yeah, I think because, and, and I don't want to, to ignore or to decry efforts some people like the Gary Dawes and the Cliff Harris's and so on, who, who, you know, applied business, business thinking and so on. Um, I mean, think of the, the, the chandeliers and the fire flights and, and so on and so on. But the kind of, the, the Chris Blackwell kind of person you're talking about, mm -hmm. we never had someone strong enough. Now, we had people with the foresight eh, and with the vision but we never had the connection of the vision and the financial means to make it happen. Uh -huh. that, that was the thing. They, <laughs> those things never co-resided. <laughs> I remember an, an old American guy told me when I was in school in New York, he said to me once at a time, ideas without finance is bullshit. <laughs> you know <what> this? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, why do you think we never got um, the corporate people on board um, and really got that backing? We're a funny country, you know. We take talent for granted in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think it's because there's a plethora of talent in this place. If I think we have the highest ratio of musicians or entertainers or creatives to population, the highest ratio in anywhere in the world, right? I mean, if you just take, I'm, I've made this point before, if you just count panists, people who play pan, mm -hmm. and put that as a fraction of the population, you already have a higher percentage than anywhere else. And you haven't added in guitar players, pianists, flautists, violinists, trombonists, trumpeters, and, and all the singers, guitar players, all the rest of you. you haven't even added them in yet. Just counting pan people, and you have a higher percentage of musicians than anywhere else. You know? And that's a good and there's a bad. The bad is that we take it for granted. Therefore, we, our culture, historically, 
has not been about really taking those things and and focusing them and 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 getting the best out of them you know it's it's never been ab about that i'm i'm sorry but that's the truth hmm Oh, Lord. so kind of you kind of freeze on me there, but we still getting the song. So um, you get it, you get the um, again the song, yeah. yeah. So we let let's um. I have a question. One question. All right, my um, have a question. Go through. Well, seeing in the corporate world, seeing you're a musician, what concerns me at present is um, the amount of artists not being able to get work with these lockdowns. Um, what you think about that, or what you feel, or what you feel that could be done? Because we have interviewed a couple of artists and they are concerned that they're not making any money. They are loss of earnings. And um, what well, you think could be done? Anything you think thing that could be done that, at this time? <clears throat> One of the things, um, excuse me, mm -hmm. that the government um, has done, for instance, is establishing a priority vaccination drive for the creative in the members of the creative industries. This will allow them to start back doing what they do in terms of getting together to create music and, and other forms of, of, of art and so on. Um, they are suffering much like many other sectors of the society and, and the economy. Um, you know, historically, when economies have floundered, it is the creative sectors that have resonated and, 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 and got back on, on, on their feet or that have carried mm. a lot of the, the weight. This, so this pandemic has, pro has presented us with a different problem where everybody, so the, not even the creators have a chance to lighten the load as it were of the society. And it is a first, I mean, if you think about the, the, the Great Depression of, of, of the 40s in, in America, mm -hmm. The music industry, the entertainment industry soared. Yeah, Dis Disney came out of the Great Depression. You understand? Yeah. And, 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 and it still was as a catalyst for regrowth of the other sectors of the economy. Here now, we do not have the opportunity to do that because of this. But like I said, the, um, that initiative by the government in, in, in fast-tracking vaccinations for creatives, that, you know, I, I hope will have some kind of impact. All right, and um, hmm. okay. Now, recently, um, in the Olympics, we Trinidad didn't do as good as we as we hoped that we would do. And um, I remember people were giving their opinions, and I and I made the comment. I said that until Trinidad sees sports and entertainment as other than just pure um recreation yeah then I, right i think we wouldn't um we wouldn't go further you know Where no, you're quite you're quite right um i mean and one can say it's difficult in in small post-colonial countries to to really give the to, to lend gravitas to that thought because most of us are beneficiaries mm -hmm. of colonial education we, we tend to process things in in in, in, a, in particular ways you know so um my mother for instance my mother taught music in her spare time she was a housewife but she taught music she was she was really good at piano and she taught piano on evenings at home um and as much as she was a supporter of sound revolution there was no way that my mother would have countenanced me being a professional musician mm -hmm. especially of the non-classical um <laughs> ilk. yeah well i too i too was um was told well molly want to be the only thing you want to be in life is a dj you know <laughs> i was told that I once heard an elder person say too that uh, when Andre Tanka passed, you know, a man turned and said, you know, Andre never do a day work in his life. <laughs> yeah, check that out. <laughs> you understand? 
check that out. Yeah, 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 you know. Um, so, yeah, but I can't get them. That is what they knew. That is what they... Yeah, exactly. That's what, as you say, right? They're coming from that post-colonial kind of thing, right? So, um, now, being a manager, post, what you were... Um, Let's say you were running, let's say you were not in the in the music business. Um would do you see yourself as someone that would have spent your money behind the industry? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um and but let me tell you, in the context of sound revolution, for instance. We invested in ourselves, you know, in terms of, of, of making sure that we had, you know, state-of-the-art equipment and so on, making sure that we would go to the studio and record and so on. So we understood the need for investing in, your, in, in, in yourself at worst. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it would not have been too much of a long shot for me to have thought of being an independent investor if I were not involved in music as a creator. It's not too much of a long shot. All right. Okay, Mario, um, you want to ask him about yeah, the... Yeah, well, the, okay, so what about the music at present? Um, are you think we're heading in the right direction with the music that you're I, hearing? I have, I have two major grouses. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's some really good music out there and so on, and you can't knock that. But you, generally, I have two grouses. One is that over the last few years, we've been tending to write songs with no storyline, just four or six hook lines, right? And you just repeat these hook lines over and 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 in the heat of the party, in the heat of the fat and the rhythm and everything and the alcohol, okay, that could do well, you know? But we haven't been, to a great extent, we haven't been creating music that people remember, that people want to take home and listen to again home. If you're not in the, in the moment and you're, you're not in, in that craziness, the music will have no value for you. That's, that's one of the problems I have. And you can't create international hits on just rhythm alone. You have to have something in the music that the people will hold on to and want to get back to and listen to again. Not just when they're inebriated, not just when they're in the throes of, of, a, of a party crowd. My second grouse is, and I'll ask a question, why would somebody who claims to be a Trinidadian performing what he claims to be a Trinidadian musical art form, soca, why would he find it necessary to speak and sing with a Jamaican accent? Mm. Well, well, a soca singer will jump on a stage and say, crowd of people. I never see so much people in a one place yet. No <laughs> one, no put, no hand in the ear. And then proceed to sing some Jamaican lyrics on a rhythm and say he's singing soca. And there's a Trinidadian. Well, it's a globalized yeah. world, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry? It's, it's a globalized world. <laughs> yeah, but funny, nobody has no other country mm -hmm. sings its music form with somebody else's accent. We are unique. No, that's not particularly true, you know. Um, a lot of Tell me where. a lot of English and 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 other even European um artists try to song the American when they do in like um R and B or, or, or exactly. But you you're missing a point. Mm -hmm. No country sings its indigenous music. Oh, okay. With somebody all right. So if you're doing reggae, it's all right to, to song Jamaican. Exactly. <laughs> so, so listen, have you ever listened to Zessa music? Listen to? Zessa music. Zessa music? No. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> May I'm asking you all that is because um, there seem to be a big trend among the youths 
And when I speak about youths, I talk about people in their 20s. That is what they like. Zessa music. They, 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 they're going for Zessa music even more than they're going for Soka music. And um, mm-hmm. it, it seems to be... And, and you know, music, you know, well, you all were... The name, Song Rev. You all were revolutionary at the time you started. From the whole Soka industry. Like think so. And the music you all did as youths revolutionized the whole thing. So now youths are doing music, of course, and I just had to respect them. I don't have to like the music because I ain't that from that era. <clears throat> but they're doing a whole revolutionize of music now where they're doing Zessa thing now and um, Gunman and Badman lyrics. Now, don't expect us to like it, but it seems to be very popular among the younger population. And like everything else, and when we look at the whole music industry, things that start off with you don't like it, and then it is developed into a big thing, as the next big thing. Just like how you all came on an era and developed as the next big thing, this is a possibility. So we, we, we can't really ignore what is being done. We don't have to like it, but it seems where, that, where the music could be heading. That's just a thing. You're not familiar with it at all. <laughs> You may have heard a couple of it, and you really find it's, but it's a kind of rubber talk music, and eh? that, that, that um, rubber talk, where the, the guy talking, and, you know, where he talking more. Robin, you're familiar with it, right? Well, I hear it a couple of times and thing, you know. Um, and that's but, where your son um, is played at. Well, yeah, my son would play it, <laughs> but, and um, it, it, no, but it getting a lot of plays on YouTube, you know, as Mike Martin Raymond was saying, that mm-hmm. that is the biggest form of music outside of, out of Trinidad. Now, it um, it had thousands and thousands and thousands of views on YouTube and, and that kind of thing, you know. All the two are the, are the biggest artists in it, um, passed away very young, you know. Um, it's crazy. Um, but I don't know. I wish them well, you know. I just wish they would... Um, find better topics to sing on, you know. I mean, it'll start, it start a certain way and then it is develop into something where it's more acceptable, you know. Okay, so you look at the history of the music over the years. Calypso was like that, Soka was like that. Everything is starting a, a revolution <laughs> kind of way and then it it, it comes mainstream, but it's after you know, simmer down somehow. Right. Well, as we reach there, Colin, let me ask you this, right? Um, the reason why Soka hasn't, well, Trinidad music on a whole hasn't made it per se, right? Um, and, and go to number one on the Billboard charts and all them foolishness that we just talk about. Is it something you think inherent in the production of the music? Like, um, you know, the the engineering, the the arrangement, you know, the production of the music, or is it more something to do with marketing and promotion? I think if I, if I had to choose one, I would choose marketing and promotion. And on the back, on the back of that, you see, if you don't believe in your own thing, how can you possibly convince somebody else to believe in it? Right? When you talk to a Jamaican, within the first sentence, you, you know he's a Jamaican. By the second sentence, you know Bob Marley come from Jamaica. By the third sentence, you know dancehall and thing and reggae come from Jamaica. You could talk to a Trinidadian for days and not know where he come from, what forms of music come from, from, from Trinidad and Tobago. We really, we, we, we talk among ourselves and say, yeah, man, we believe in soca and soca thing and thing. If we believed in it so much, how can we just change it at women fancy, just like that? How can we just change our accent just singing somebody else's accent just like that. You see, I ask people a simple question. Probably that's the Kaiso in it. <laughs> well, I will call you. So I'm calling you, right, Robin? Yeah, no, man. BMW is the best car in the world. I really, I'm a BMW salesman and I'm trying to get you to buy BMW and so on. For months. And then I say, you know something? Come on, come. Let me pick you up and let me go and test drive a BMW, bro. Right? And you agree to that, right? Mm-hmm. But I come to pick you up, to carry it to test drive a BMW, but I drive in a Benz. Where's my credibility? <laughs> well, yeah, as okay. simple as that. Mm-hmm. I come in a Benz to carry you to drive 
A BMW, I tell you, BMW is the best car boy. You can't be with Daisy Carter have by driving a Benz. So when I telling you that Trinidad culture is so strong, boy, we have all kind of things to offer. And soca is the best thing. And as I put on a soca, there's a dance hall, a, 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 a loop, a dance hall loop that is the bed of that soca. And on top of that, I'm singing with a Jamaican accent. I lose credibility one time. When I could sing, and no disrespect, eh? General Grant is my partner. General Grant used to be on song rev stage, chanting reggae and thing. Because we, as you know, song rev used to play reggae. Yeah. Well ending, eh? What was the name of the band again? Right. Free. Free, right? That was the name of the band? Which one? Yeah. Well, they had a reggae band named Freeman. Um, Used to, oh. pl used to play with um, Jolly and then used to play in the, uh, in the yeah, band, yeah, right? Yeah. You wrote these some um, song revolution, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And in the scheme oh, done by, by Nairon after Carnival, they used to play there a lot. Good, eh? Your memory real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. Have, they, they used to have 12 tribes band too. Right, and you used Woody to... Woody's had one. Right, and you used, to, you, you used to play guitar in that one. <laughs> and you used to play keyboard in song rev, right? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. man. Right. Next thing, anyway, let me not go there. So, uh, <laughs> what's the point I was making? Sorry. <laughs> right, you know, um, if you come to pick me up, you're trying to sell me a, a BMW, but you're coming a Benz. I, I drive in a Benz. I lose credibility. I have none. You know, so we, we need to start believing ourselves and not just talking the talk. We had to walk the walk. I was making a, a, a point about General Grant. Mm -hmm. Um. I love him dearly. But you remember this song? May I go take soca music straight to the Billboard yeah. charts? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to take soca music straight to the Billboard charts, but you're singing dance hall to say that? Yeah, and it was a remake song. It's a song he took from another another reggae thing. But, um, so, well, the, the record company he was with at the time, you know, I didn't want to be too controversial, that, but somehow they believed that, that um, you know, um, to have a hit, you just have to ape something else, you know, like, you know, and I used to be quarreling with them about that all the time, you know what I mean? Although they did develop the, the kind of rap so thing too, right? But basically that was on a kind of a back burner, you know what I mean? The 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 billboard chart thing was the was the, the thing that they heavily push, you know what I mean? But as you say, we had to learn to believe in it more. That is my, um, right? My personal thing, as I say, is that I just believe we have to make good music for us, for ourselves, and, and then people will like it. Once it's good, just make good music. That's, that's, that's my position, right? But I, who is me, you know? Um, but you know that's the Jamaican position too. No? The Jamaican will do thing and sing with his thing, even though people say, but... I can't understand what he's saying. He said, boy, if you don't understand it, go in. Because I'm not change my accent for you. I'm not sing just so, but I have the accent. And people fight and fight and learn to understand it. Check that out. But you know what it is too? Um, I remember some years ago with my, um, with my friend, um, God rest his soul, Jerome Francic, song engineer and trombone player. And, um, Very well. Right, and, and we, we were in, in Amar studio at the time, Caribbean Song Basin, and they were having an audition there that was a Saturday morning, I think. We were doing something in the studio, and we came outside. And, and Jerome, who worked in, in Federal and in, in Dynamic in Jamaica, you know, um, when we see all these youths wearing all these kind of brand name shoes and, and you know, jewelry and all them things, you know, Jerome say, this is our audition. Jerome say when you have an audition in Jamaica by, by Dynamic or Federal, he say you see men come in rags, literally people in rags, and he say you just hear the cry in the voice, you know, when they're singing in the studio, you know what I mean? So, you know, maybe is, is that the passion, the, the, you know, maybe we too, um, we have it too easy or something, I don't know, the oil, the oil, maybe it's the oil. Uh, you know, we're we, we, not suffering we, enough. We're not suffering enough. <laughs> eh, you think it's that we are suffering, uh, right? So you think the oil, money, and stuff um, made it that less of a priority to have a music business that's thriving and thing than um, of course, 
because of the energy and sector? Even though, even though several administrations have spoken about diversification, um, you know, we have we, we hear what they say, but when it comes time now for the brass tax, you know, everything doesn't quite um, work out. It doesn't mirror that that um, that philosophy. Hmm. So much can be done eh, with 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 our music. So much. There's a, a world out there that that we could take and really manhandle musically, in. because we got talent here by the grab. Hmm. But so Mario, you still think we had a remix the music yeah, and yeah. all that? What about the remixing of the music? I mean, a lot of this, the, the music, I mean, even like football dance, for instance, that went on a reggae type of part and a lot of people start to make songs using a sort of reggae beat or a hip-hop beat when they could have followed like what the English doing and go a more dance beat and maybe Soka might have gone into different, more regions than try to go down the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the reggae and the hip-hop beat. You know, what do you think about that? The, the remixing? Well, if we had gone down a more club dance beat with the soca rather than try to take it more reggae. I don't like, like what's going on well, now, yeah. for instance. Now, yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that would facilitate that kind of grafting is dup, 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 that, that kick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, that gives you a, a lot of dance flexibility um, I know it is interesting there, just as a sidebar. When we went from do, 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 which is standard calypso from a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Gina and Dinah, Rosita and Clementina, do, 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 do. At some point, we said um, that's too difficult for white people to dance. Uh -huh. So that kind of pushed us more towards the street quarter note, do, do, do. Jop, jop, Four on the floor. So hard that, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. And the joke is, the Jamaicans then took that dup, 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 and made it dance all. They went dup, 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 tack, dup, dup, tack. <laughs> Same three beats, you know, <laughs> that we thought white people couldn't dance to. And the Jamaicans have them dancing to that beat all over the world. Yeah, <laughs> As they said, they, they, did, um, they couldn't tell where the one was. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the argument. Right. They, they, they tell him where the one was, the, where the one is in dance hall, though. Yeah. Same three uh, beats. Um, interestingly, the, the three the, kicks is two kicks and a snare. The <laughs> album that he was working on that he never released. Did you do any songs in a sort of jazz flavor, for instance? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear that. Mario. The album that you didn't release. No. Right? Uh -huh. Um, did you do any of your songs in a sort of a jazzy? type of flavor? Um, uh, in terms of producers, I like... Uh, like like the, some of the old material, of, did you do it over in a sort of a jazzy flavor? I think there, there's room for... Because it's a different era, a different type of music, and yeah. people would have wanted to hear more... A different tone of song, but... So I was just asking if you, you did anything like that on the album. Well, I wouldn't quite use the word jazz. <laughs> like... For instance, two of the songs um, are kind of R&B-ish. Mm -hmm. um, so the the produces, produces there is kind of, I consider interesting. One in particular, um, just this once, which the original was on the 1986 Song Revolution album. <laughs> um, and it's it's redone. Um, Roger George did the, the, the lead vocals on it. It's, it's interesting listening. Um, I wouldn't expect if I do release the album, I wouldn't expect it to be. It's it's it has a definite old school ish approach, and that was deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, so more like people who just want to get into some music, they want to hear some music, might be attracted to that. Um, as against nineteen year olds or twenty year olds who you know their their tastes are a little different. But I just call it lounge music, you know, music you could put on and just listen to and appreciate. Lounge yes. type of music, you know, you sit down and you're probably having a drink and you're enjoying the music and, you know, um, that, that's what I look at it as, that. So mm -hmm. was, I was looking to see the album heading in that direction 
or it's still headed in a soca direction or whatnot. You know, I feel there's room for you to release an album using some of this old song rev music and even some of your modern songs in a more listening feel that a, a person could put on and appreciate. That's what I feel. There's a market for that for you at this time. Absolutely. Well, there's a, there's a market for that because, as I was saying earlier, mm-hmm. very few people will take very few of current soccer and play it in the office, you know, they, while they're working, just yeah. because it, it, it's, it's not listen to music. Mm-hmm. Just drink and wine and carry on. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not saying that's all that there's there, but a large percentage of what is out there is not what you will say, you will put aside time to go listen to. You know, you'll react it if you're going live, you know, you're partying, but you, you won't be listening to it. Well, is it that... So you're right. All right. Is it that right. um, what I say we do, our music industry, or the soca industry is, we, we are servicing the, the, the carnivals of the world, right? And um, But do you think that we could... Um, make other musics, you know, that, um, all right, for instance, Groovy Soca, what do you think of the potential of that? Because they used to complain that the melody is gone, but some of these kind of new Groovy Soca have like nice melodies, you know, yeah, and, um, I, agree. I, agree. I was wondering if, if that is a way to go, if we could start you know, um, and you know, it don't take nothing in Trinidad for, for something to change. All it takes is success. All you need is one good song going down a certain kind of way. And then the next year, brrr, you had 10 of that, right? <laughs> you know? So, um, I don't know. What think? What you reward. Hmm? A society gets what it rewards. That's, that's the fact of life. I mean, and you talk about Groovy Soka. And as you know, mm-hmm. um, Groovy soccer happening long, long time, you know. I mean, Stay is a good example, but an even better example. Remember Carl and Carol from now on? Right, yeah. Baby from now on. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you could take that song now and put it in the middle of an American playlist mm-hmm. and say, yes, yes, uh, uh, but call it something else. Don't, don't tell them it's RB or something. Call it something else. Caribbean groove. Yeah, maybe it's time too because um, I'm seeing a lot of um, the artists now embracing the the the, the Caribbeanness or the you know yeah, where long ago yeah. people used to be playing that they, they, there's so American American. Everybody now is so glad to say that you know you know I'm from I'm from Trinidad and <laughs> you know and that I kind of thing you know. Aunt. She's from Trinidad. Yeah, she's from Trinidad. You know. Um, I see this guy Winston Duke on Stephen Colbert show, you know, talking about yeah, Trinidad and Tobago, and um, we, when I was growing up, heads when people died, they had the nine nights and all them kind of thing, you know. What I mean, so people, uh, maybe now is the time to take back some of them old songs and do them over, and you know, morning loving and stay and, huh? That'd be real interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I really will WhatsApp you those songs, share them with Mario for me now. All right, no problem. WhatsApp them to you, just send them over to me. You might find them, a few of them, interesting listening. All right. Uh, But how are we getting the youths now to record over some of them songs? Good question. Because, you know, one of the things is we don't have good um, transition, culture transition, and culture coaching and mentoring Mm -hmm. um, in Trinidad. Uh, Part might be due to lethargy on, on, on the part of the seniors like myself, but part is also due to uh, a disposition of, I read all your old fellas really can't tell me nothing. You know. mm-hmm. I'm making money, all your time done gone, all you can't really tell me nothing. And, you know, that that is a very unfortunate thing. Yep. Because I don't know, I don't know an art form in the world that has succeeded where that kind of attitude prevails. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a good segue now. Um, yeah, we need to end soon. So, right, moving forward, tell me, Colin Lucas, how do we move this music forward? What? Where do we go from here? 
the million dollar question. One of the things that I find is that we need to really start being sincere about talent hmm. and separating it from just mere personal popularity. There are practitioners in our in our industry who, if you really have to be honest with yourself, some of them can't even sing. They can't sing. They they sing in flat, sharp, everything. Okay, but can't sing. Yeah, and but some of them touting as as our big brand. When you tell somebody hey, this is a top artist in Trinidad, and then the person listens to them and is listening to somebody who cannot sing. That shoots your credibility in the head. In. You say, that is where them fellas come in. Okay, but I can also tell you that, I mean, I know people, I know song engineers and stuff who has worked on million dollar records and things. And a lot of big, big stars, um, they tell me can't sing to save their life. That they were they, not presented as that. They would have to. They had to. He te, a man tell me he a very big star. He tell me he had to spend five hours comping together just a lead vocal, a word here, a line here, a thing because she just couldn't sing, you know. And but be, but, it, it, but it's a machine behind it, right? And you fixed it. Yeah, there's a machine to fix marketing, right? Um, I don't think we have that. We ain't tap into that machine yet. No, nah, man. We have yeah. that kind of technology here. No, 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 no. Not just the, the it's not just the technology. Not just the technology. Is, 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 uh, right. I mean, yeah, we had the technology, no, right? But is is somebody to take that person who can sing and say, hey, yeah. they had the right look, they had the right this, they had the right that. Just you make sure that that somehow you have something that could work to go on the record, right? If you had to yeah, auto-tune, oh, yeah. you had to cut, if you had to this, you know? So yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. oh, oh, the reason I'm saying that is that talent ain't all it is. A lot of them can sing too, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? The, the face might be nice or the, the thing, they could, mm. you know what I mean? Now that mightn't be my particular cup of tea, but... Mm. probably that is what it is going on in the world. <laughs> yeah, but where we fall short is we we still present it as as can't sing. We don't we don't fix that. You know? We good with that. Yeah man, that cool with that. Yeah, I yeah, cool. Right. Um mice Martin Raymond was saying that um he thinks the problem is just that we we don't stay long enough on the songs like you know um if we have four hours in the studio we do it in four hours however it's song we do <laughs> come back to it no and also um the mighty sparrow the other night in um in what's the name radio city what, what, what hall he was in yeah. so, big hall in the states right um yeah, yeah lincoln lincoln center right yes and um the thing is, you know, everybody was the band was no Trinidadians but they were proficient and um and people were saying, well, look, how come they could have... I say, because once you have the budget and um, and you could take the time, right? Like here, if we, we, we might only have money for a, a dress rehearsal night in Queens Hall, which we ain't getting through. By the time we finish song check and the lighting do one thing, we ain't get a chance to song check the band properly. And, and it has always been that kind of thing, right? Whereas... Um, when you see a show like that, some it's days of rehearsal, you know, and days of, you know. So I think it's just probably the budgets. I don't know. What do you think? That certainly impacts, but you know, that's why when you go by Mice and you go by Graham Wilson and you go by Neil Bernard and them, there's no such thing as an hourly rating. <laughs> but right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nice that long time, those guys. And they will never, you will never see an hourly rate. They say, look, this project, the, the, the budget for this project is so and so and so. Let's do it right. All right. So we are the people that could do it right. So is somebody right. Else, but you know, some of the younger people would not want to listen to a mice 
you know, they would say, boy, he old, he over 40. No, but my yes. teaching, my teaching the, the new gen, the younger generation now. Yeah. My son yes. Robin, I'm sure and them, you but, know. Yeah, no, I agree with you, yeah, Robin and thing, lecturing and thing too. But some of the people out there, the proponents, the people who are going out on the stage and men, mm-hmm. that deliver, that execute, they're not going to be in the classroom to listen to, um, to them. They, quite often, they're not the beneficiaries. And quite often, they're not even listening to the beneficiaries. Because we tend to have a culture here of mediocrity. That good enough. That good enough. You see that? See that good enough? That will be our death knell. Well, no. We must ensure that it is not our death knell. We okay. have to embrace a culture of excellence. All right, that is a good place to end. Mario, you have anything else to ask, Mr. Lucas? Yeah, yeah, just for the public sake. Um, Robin, you father here too? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're still but, performing, Colin, right? You're still doing your performances? No. no? I, st- I stopped. The same time I decided not to release the album was the same time I said, you know something? So you perform for I years then? What do I mean? Yes. Wow. So when you retire from your job, do you plan to get involved in the music and somehow helping artists? Well, or... You know the joke is that, mm-hmm. that I really was retired already. <laughs> 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 this NCC thing is, is post-retirement. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah I, listen, guys, 65, you know. Uh-huh. Well, both of we catching up with you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you come first, Mario, second, and I third. <laughs> <laughs> Gold, silver, and bronze. But what do you feel you could give to the, the industry on the whole? I mean, like, upcoming artists. I mean, Sorry, it, I it, what do you feel you could give to upcoming artists on the whole and advise them accordingly? I mean, as as we're about to end. I, I mean, pay you did mention it, but just say it over again, some of the things. Pay attention to the business. Pay attention to the execution. Things that you will get away with in Trinidad, the, the external markets are a lot more discerning, you know? And especially if you're trying to, to introduce new music forms, new art forms to them and tell them, you want them to love it to the extent where they will buy it in amounts that, that, that would make things, um, you know, make economic sense. You cannot give them suboptimal produce. You, you just, you cannot do it. You'll get away with that here because, well, you know, all of we in here, we love that or anything. No, you can't give the international market that they will not accept it, especially from, from us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy. So excellence in your art form and pay attention to the business. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Well, Colin, good, boy, good, it good was job, so man. nice talking to you. And I don't know, maybe we could... Talk again in the future when you release the new album. <laughs> when, whenever you call, I'll write here for you. All mm. right, all right. Thanks a mil, Colin, yeah, thanks boy. For calling. Have a nice yes, night. Guys. Enjoy. You to reach home before the curfew, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah all right. Mario had to go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> talk, don't let me have to talk to Gary for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. So, Mario, boy, Colin Lucas. Good show. All right, so next week we will bring you another moving forward. (laughs) All right, Mario, cool. All right, have fun.